Man, this is Deion Dawkins, man, and you're listening to The Scoop on OwlScoop.com. You already should know. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Scoop, OwlScoop.com's podcast, Season 8, Episode 15. I'm John DiCarlo, joined once again by a full house of Kyle Gauss, Javon Edmonds, Caden Steele, Javon and Caden are, are sharing a Zoom screen once again, which is just adorable. They just look happy, optimistic. I feel insulted. Why do you feel insulted? I don't know. Adorable is like an insulting word to me. I don't mean for it to be insulting. I what know. Would you rather, what would you rather? What would you rather? What, what do you want me to call you? You look at like Michael B. Jordan lookalike, Javon right. Edmonds. <laughs> Dude, I don't know. Adorable <laughs> just feels like demeaning. Like if, like that's like you look at somebody like, huh, that's cute. Like you know, like that just, that's one of my go-to insults. Maybe uh, you think I'm, you think I'm friend zoning you on this pod. That's what you think I'm doing. <laughs> I'm not doing that. In I less think- than a minute, he has established that you are not a sexual prospect, Javon. You are just, <laughs> you're- <laughs> and we're off to a weird start. <laughs> you know, I take it. I take it. Number fifteen, <laughs> please. Let's move on. Famous number fifteen. <laughs> Uh, I love Anthony Russo. That's um, who you go with. First. No, Vince Sanity. Yep. Um, Tim Tebow. Tebow. Uh, Michael Crabtree. Oh, God, Crabtree. Mark Starr. Yeah. Um, Yankees catcher. Boo. Thurman Munson. Thurman Munson. Wow. Carmelo Anthony. Mm-hmm. Is he always um, more fifteen, or did he change? He he changed to number seven after the Nuggets. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Magic Johnson with the Dream Team. Pat Egan from the Fanatic said that it's remarkable how you're able to just recall the the Olympic numbers all the time. Seriously, like you're the only like Magic Johnson doesn't know that he wore 15 on the Dream Team. <laughs> I'm pretty you know sure. That? And you that's like that. the most Magic esque number. You know, he he walks down his hallway of all his memories. He has foes of him cutting the the banner at all the AMC theaters they own or wherever they're called. And he just goes past the number 15 jersey. Like, he just keeps walking. But you. Oh, Ron Artest wore number 15. We forgot uh, about Mahomes. Is he, ba- is, he, is he back to Ron Artest? Or is it Meta World Peace? World Peace. He was Ron Artest when he was wearing 15. Ron Artest going into the stands in Detroit was like a top three moment of my childhood. Like, mm-hmm. watching it live. Palace. Watching it yes. live in Indiana, I was like, no way. No way they're doing this. And it just grain, grainy little, like, 13-inch CRT TV. Just Ron Artest. Jermaine O'Neal. <laughs> I watched it. I watched a documentary on that uh, for a class the other day. The fact that the one fan got on the court and squared up with Ron Artest. Like, literally squared up. Like, yeah. let's do this. And, just, and he oh. was definitely hammered on, like, oh, yeah. seven or eight uh, beers. Just uh, Yes. It might have been more than seven or eight beers there, Caden. <laughs> my my Caden, dude was feeling no pain. Caden, are there any old, obscure Eagles that wore number 15? You're usually good for... I'm trying to think. Did uh, Steve Van Buren wear 15? We might have. Uh, we did let's... point out that we forgot Patrick Mahomes somehow. Somewhere. Yes, we did. Um, did Steve Van Buren wear number? Yes, he did wear number fifteen. That's very yeah, good. Boy. Didn't let's... Jeff Hostetler, when he came in and backup quarterback duty for the Giants, win a Super Bowl number fifteen? I think he was fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Eagles wide re- Eagles Justin. wide receiver that has had a resurgence in fantasy football relevance. Matt and Collins. Matt, Matt Collins, fifteen. Mm-hmm. Didn't. No, Aguilar didn't wear 15. Aguilar wore um he wore 15 in New England. Uh, yeah, New England, he really? wore 15. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, not for not for the Eagles. 17. Chad, Hall, Hall, for Chad Hall wore 15. Oh. Well, Air Force boy. hmm Anyway, yeah. it's a good solid list. We've got a lot to talk about today. We've got some we've got some uh, we have a pretty full mailbag. Uh before we you know, um, Chad Hall wore 16. Kiss. Oh, he did. Okay. For a right. myself. Um, we have a, a 54 28 Temple win over USF to talk about on the football field. We'll preview Saturday's game against Houston. And then, of course, we'll talk about what the hell happened on Monday night when Temple opened its basketball season and lost to Wagner. You guys are upset. You guys are ticked off. We get it. We will, we will, we will talk to you in the mailbag. We will listen. We are your shoulder to cry on. We'll we'll answer those questions to the best of our ability. And then I've also also, of course, we will preview Temple's game against Villanova 
Friday night, a top 25 team in Villanova. Ken Temple bounce back. Can they not bounce back? Again, a lot of stuff to cover. Let's get to the 54-28 route of USF first. Before you start, I just want to say, for a guy who always tells us students that he doesn't have radio experience, your cold open of what the hell happened Monday night was the most radio intro you've ever had on the school, and I'm kind of a fan of it. All right. Uh, conversely, to humble you, I thought it was terrible, and you should never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Javon and Kyle. I'll I'll take your I'll take your feedback. All right. Um, obviously, unless you're living under a rock, you you know by now that that Ed CD's 334 yards of total offense were the were one of the biggest or the biggest story of the day. Uh, he was named the Doak Walker Co Running Back of the Week nationally. So 265 yards on the ground, three touchdowns, 69 yards on four carries. And again, this is coming from what had been the second worst rushing offense in the entire country. Temple was 129th among 131 FBS teams. Now they're 122nd. So progress there. Uh, career day for EJ Warner, 27 of 36 passing for 344 yards, two touchdowns, Camden Price, the place kicker had a big day, 18 points for a program record, a single game program record, his three first half field goals kept them in the game. And uh, a big play uh, on a day when the, the defense really didn't play super well. They gave up 471 yards. Jacob Hollins' fumble recovery kind of stemmed the tide. Temple turned that turnover into the Adonica Sanders one-handed touchdown catch, and that made it a three-score game. So we knew that Temple was capable of beating USF. They're you know they're a bad team, but they're still a, a conference game. I think Kyle and I predicted wins. Javon, did you predict a loss? Did you and Caden predict a loss? We both predicted losses. However, I'm going to like take a little bit of liberty right here with the Jeff Scott takes that I had last week. Oh, you really went out on a limb with those, Javon. <laughs> <laughs> It's, ne just... it's never a good sign as a program if losing to you gets a coach fired. Yes. Like, that's not usually a great sign. <laughs> at all. <laughs> at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I just kind of, kind of like put like a bow on Emmy or to recap it. I mean, I think we were talking all season about how like wins and losses weren't the most important aspect of this season. And it was more about like, how are they playing? And for the last couple of weeks, I've kind of thought like they needed a game that you're like, okay, this offense can work because like it just had not worked to this point. Like you started seeing some signs. It sounds ridiculous to say like you actually kind of started to see some signs, even in like the UCF game. Like, yeah, they got blown out, but, like, Edward Sadie was able to get some yards, like, more, like, uh, stretching the field. And then you saw a little bit more against Navy, and it's a little more against Tulsa, and then it finally blows up against USF. So I think it's just, like, a feel-good, like, look, the offensive line can block in this conference, and you do have a running back that might be good if you can actually block for him. And Jose Barbon might set, like, a franchise or program record for 100-yard games in a season. Like, there are there is some talent. I think if you could wave a wand and you could copy and paste that offensive line performance for over 12 games, then this is a bowl team, but like you can't and they haven't performed as well as they did. But well, I I don't want to say, um, Kyle, you've been leaving me to be the bad guy, bad guy for the past. Timmy knows that like, I'm usually the negative one and I feel like you've been the negative one. Yeah. The I feel like you've been setting me up for it. So I'll, I'll come in and relief for you again and say not to be the Debbie downer. Um, if you say it was USF, I swear to God. <laughs> that, that is where I'm going. I'm so, I can't give the offensive line credit for this game. Like me and Kate, I said I told Caden a few times. I feel like I've said it to a few other people. I'll say it again. If Temple is parting the Red Sea on you, that means you as a defensive line. It's just awful. Before last Saturday, Edward Sadie, 290 yards, one touchdown on 85 carries. Good enough for a whopping 3.4 yards per carry. He's but Javon, you, you complained yards. last week that they were running the ball so well. Why did they keep on, running the ball? Hold on, hold on, hold on, Kyle. I know you, you can have that one. I can see the to the feet when you first made the point. <laughs> but now, like now, Sadie has 500 something yards, 551, if I remember correctly, and it's averaging 5.1 yards per carry. Like, so Kyle's whole point of how averages work, yeah. right? the flaw of them, like it showed this week. Like, I'm sorry. I want to give Temple credit. I really do. But I just can't. Like, when you've played as bad as you have all season and then something like this happens, you have, like, this astonishing game, that just tells you how poor the opponent was. So both things can be true, though, yes. right? Like you're, yes, you're, 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 yeah. yeah, you're viewing it in a black and white standpoint where, like, 
they're mutually exclusive. Like the fact that remains like, is USF bad? Yeah, USF's very bad. Did Temple score more points against them than any other team this year? Yes. Yeah, like, and it's BYU, Louisville, Florida, Houston, Cincinnati didn't perform as well as Temple performed against them. Like both these things can be true. Yeah, and I'll throw in this rebuilding program. It is a highlight for a coaching staff yeah. to see that you guys went out and did what they were supposed to do. That is the first box to check. And we said that earlier in the season with the UMass and the Lafayette games. The rebuilding staff, it is a highlight to see your team do what it's supposed to do. Yeah, so like I, I think I will throw that in there. I think there's always a debate about like, is it easier to correct things following like a loss or a win from a coaching standpoint? And like, I think it, it's easier following a loss, like if you're a winning program. If you start off 6-0, and but you've been getting away with things and then you lose that seventh game, then, like, yeah, you can build upon that. When you've been a losing program and wins are few and far between, like, I think you need a win every now and then just to, like, keep them focused. Because, like, if you're going to end your season on nine straight losses, eight straight losses, like, it's kind of hard to build upon that. So they needed something. Credit to them for, honestly, dominating a second half and never punting the ball and, and winning in probably the most dominating fashion against a conference opponent since, like, some of those bad UConn teams when you they would win 60 to 12 or 28 to nothing against those teams. So yeah. I'm not going to let Javon rain on this. I think Temple fans deserve to be a little happy about this and be a little encouraged by, by Edward Sadie. Especially Green. considering he's coming back, like, unless something changes, like a lot of the guys we talked about are coming back next year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'd rather be the latter of the two scenarios that you pointed out, like the, the ones that need that know they need to correct some stuff because of the losses instead of the ones who've been getting away with wins because those teams always look, you know, like bad at them. Like Pittsburgh Steelers two years ago, you know, just stealing wins all season long. And then I'm trying to tell people that's not a good team. In December, oh, don't and get me ago. wrong. I would rather go 10-6 and six with with flawed wins than 6-10 and 10 with, <laughs> with and I, you know, I'd ra- see me Maybe because the person I am, I'd rather be 6-10, and 10, know the team's bad, and they know they're bad and have to improve, than go 13-3. and three, And, like, it's because you had a weak schedule and just had some lucky what wins. A, what what a, a wild 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 wild. Let me finish. Let me finish. And then you get to the playoffs and you just get embarrassed, no, you know? Like, no, I'm not a fan of the first no. match. No. <laughs> way too much negative. I would, I would rather go – you were saying I'd rather lose 70% of my games than be, like, the number one seed and just lay an egg in the playoffs. No. Yeah, then be a fake number one. Yes. What's fake about it? They I, want I would rather be the Sacramento Kings – then the Donovan Mitchell, Rudy Gobert. How many pro teams can we bring into this podcast? Wait, real quick. Now, now you're showing your age because the Sacramento Kings in the 2000s were the definition of fraud one seed. I'm talking about these kings. The De'Aaron Fox. They would always see Webb once. I see Webb Webb. would always go 56 and 26, and him and Peja would lose in the finals. They never made it. Not not the C. Webb Kings, the De'Aaron Fox Kings. I'd rather be the De'Aaron Fox Kings than the Donovan Mitchell Jazz. Caden, Caden, save us, save us from becoming an NBA podcast. Just say anything, real quick, (laughs) real quick. The whole point of sports is anything can happen in the playoffs you just saw it with the phillies you just want to get to the playoffs and beyond that it happens sure revisionist would you rather not lose in the first round yeah but anybody that says they'd rather not make the playoffs than make the playoffs is lying to your face you are lying I'm not, to I'm our faces to to miss the playoffs of you are lying to our talk. i guess i'll come in here and try to save it unlike jose alvarado could but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, <laughs> uh I'm gonna okay said I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like i'm more on uh the latter side with Javon and in the sense that I, I, I'm not seeing kind of black and white like Javon, where I think there is positives that Bryce Tome and, and Wisdom course, she played good because, hey, they haven't played good all year. They could have still stunk against USF, but they didn't. So I guess you could take that away. But if you're a Temple fan and you think, you know, the solutions on this roster, maybe these players like Edward Sadie and Bryce Tome, maybe they'll start putting it together where you don't have to fix those roster spots. I think that's a little, you know. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think Edward Sadie all of a sudden is going to be this amazing running back. I think I had to do more of it. It's an indictment against USF and what the program is, but he still took advantage of his opportunities. He's clearly the number one running back on this team, which is saying a lot because I think Edward Sadie's better off as a change of pace, number two, three running back in the rotation. I don't know if he's truly a starter. Like so he I- had one, he had one good game. And it was against USF, but before that, he wasn't really doing anything that really stood out. He had that big run against Navy where he leaped to defender, but I mean, he had up 130 yards of offense the week before, too. Uh-huh. Like, yeah, like I think Edward Sadie's been playing fairly well, considering all things. And like the fact that he's distanced himself from Darvin Hubbard and Trey Blair and Jakari Norwood left the program. And like, and Stan said that too. He's glad Ed stepped up when somebody yeah. needed to. Uh-huh. I just, I, I, 
I, as Kyle said, I think all these things can be true. Look, we know USF stinks. They had, I think, what, the 122nd ranked Russian right. defense heading into Saturday. So a bad run defense. But I, I know I'm stating the obvious here. They're rebuilding. I've seen, what, two, three, four different iterations of Temple rebuilding its football program. You need to play who's in front of you, and you need to have success. And I, I still think you have to give guys like Bryce Toman and Wisdom Quarshi who had not played well previously they're still division one players in front of them that they're blocking for ed sadie on a few different runs did not get caught behind from 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 behind by d1 defensive backs that's absolutely stuff you can build upon he needed a lot of tank yeah they have to they have to have stuff to build upon i i don't i don't come out of it yes like yeah, the first half was dicey. Even the the second part of the the first part of the second half was all dicey. Like I said, until they made it a three score game, I, I still think that's a huge step forward. I don't think any of us are trying to misrepresent the win or what it was, but you still you still beat a team in your league. Yes, they're one and eight. They just got their coach fired. But like, I don't I don't walk away from it saying, okay, oh wow, Temple's ready to contend for a conference championship. But like all of these players that they have developed into NFL talents in the past, it's not like Oh, Nate Harrison. Well, he's only he's only covering this guy. He's only covering that guy. These guys get better and better and better and better. And either some of them are, some of them aren't. So I still think it was a big step forward for him. And it's a positive sign for, you know, what EJ Warner, if you saw that they had the right pieces around them, if they can develop that run game, if they can protect him more and albeit against USF and they didn't get a ton of pressure against him, it was easier to run the ball. But had his arguably his best career day, looked really comfortable from the pocket because he wasn't facing, you know, that adversity. Like he has, especially at the end of that Navy game where they could not protect EJ Warner. They got after him, which pretty much ended all the momentum. So that's an encouraging sign going forward. Even if, you know, Bryce Toman and Wisdom Corsi aren't necessarily the guys, it showed you if he had the right units around him, EJ Warner can be a really good college quarterback. So I think that was a positive step in the right direction. And also, I think, you know, even though I, I think Xavier Weaver Jr., you know, had a you know a good day for USF, I think that was a good test for Jalen McMurray. Even though he had some success against him, you're going against some of the better wide receivers in the conference. And I don't want to say, he, I don't know if he's a top two wide receiver in the did conference. Did he just enter the really, portal, too? Am I making that up? Did, did he hit the portal? I, I, I think he Because, like, they're allowed to enter the portal once a, a coaching a coach is fired. They have, yeah, like, a, like a, a, month a window. Fired. Or, yeah, it's like 30 days, which yeah. it would have overlapped with the regular thing. Anyway, but I think he entered the portal. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. I, th- I think he's a power five. Uh, Operation uh, Raid USF's roster. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of wide receivers, um, John, this is what we call a segue. Yeah. Um, I think Stan Drayton, when he talked about in the post game, like, yeah, we we can look at what Jose Barbon did and all those guys like catching the ball, mm-hmm. but a big part of Sadie's success, which was, you know, you you, you look at the numbers, tied with Rykel Armstead for some stuff like mm-hmm. outside of the line, the wide receivers are doing a good job blocking downfield too. beautiful so beautiful beautiful setup javon yes read, did... read the athletic article by rock Holmer said yes very that. good very good um so stan drayton on monday talked about how well the wide receivers block particularly jose barbon and here's what he had to say on monday when it came time to talking about those guys playing their part and paving the way for edward sadie when you looked at the film, who was blocking better? What did you see on film? Like our receivers, who... our receivers did a great job. Jose did a phenomenal job of bodying up people uh, as the ball was approaching his area. And uh, I'll tell you what, DeJuan Mathis did a phenomenal job on backside cutoffs on a lot of these explosive plays. And, you know, those are, those are char- character checks. You know, it really tells you a lot about the individual. Um, who's not receiving the football, who's away from the play, but it's kind of put forth that area, that type of effort uh, to block for his, his brother. Um, that, that tells you a lot about how we're growing as a football team, how the individual themselves are growing and becoming very unselfish. And that's how you win ball games. It's a very unselfish effort in the game of football, and everybody has to be bought into it. And uh, to be able to put those examples in front of our team uh, for them to continue to grow in that, in that way is, was pretty, pretty neat, pretty special. Another piece of audio that I thought was worth playing is obviously with Adam Klein coming back at center, they had the two straight false starts where it's like everybody, but the center false started on consecutive plays. He had some bad snaps and, you know, Stan Drayton was asked about that on Monday and it was a good explanation because it wasn't all on Adam Klein. He talks a little bit about how EJ Warner 
didn't recognize a bear front. Adam recognized it before he did. So uh, I think this lends a little bit of insight as well. So here's Stan Drayton talking about some of those miscues that they had there with the with the snaps and, and the recognition and everything. You know, anxious quarterback, um, they were flipping the front on us, you know, getting into a bear front. And um, anytime we get into a bear front, you know, our offensive line has to communicate all the way down the line what's going on. And our quarterback was um, – not necessarily recognizing the front switch as fast as Adam was, all right? And Adam, in the misses communication, um, was getting a, a, a clap and a snap from our quarterback, which receivers hear the snap and they trigger. You know, O-line still communicating, so they're standing still. So we had way too many of those. You know, we had five of them, you know, and uh, that is something that, um, as we start to play really good opponents, uh, those self-inflicting penalties have to disappear, you know. All right, so as we said, Temple faced a, a pretty good wide receiver in USF. Now, now they got a real good one on their hands. Houston coming off a, a weird 77-63 shootout loss to SMU. We know how good Clayton Toon is, leads the American with more than 27 yards passing, 28 touchdowns. He's also rushed for 386 yards and four touchdowns. And they have a very good wide receiver, Nathaniel Dell, already 73 catches for 919 yards and 12 touchdowns. So he's going to be a real task for Jalen McMurray or whoever is rolling coverage over to him. Um, Houston's got the second worst Scoring defense in the conference, obviously, statistically speaking, you're, you're not going to give up 77 points every week. So that certainly didn't help, but they're giving up more than 36 points a game. Um, and defensively, they have they do have a few players who can get to the quarterback. Derek Parrish, has a, he was a second-team all-conference player last season. He's got five sacks. DeAnthony Jones has four. Stan Drayton talked a lot on Monday, obviously, about how important it'll be to put pressure on Clayton Toon. We'll start with that question. Obviously, I don't. I don't even know what the line is on on this game. I'm sure they're not going to be favored or, or sure yeah, they're going to be double points. digit. Yeah, I think it's twenty. It's 20. Okay. Yeah. You so, know, I think that's big. I really do. And and Kyle, we can bring our conversation from the group chat into this pod. I say a lot of things. You got to be more specific. <laughs> this, is one of, this is this is one of those Dana Holgerson years. Yeah. Like he's a every other year coach, which I don't think you can bring into the Big Twelve. I really don't. Um, he's an every other year coach. This is one of the other years where this is the underperforming Houston Cougars. Yeah, I mean they when were projected to win the conference, right? Yeah, they by the coaches. Like yeah. when you combine that with how bad they have been in terms of giving up points, and I once again I said it on Monday at at the presser, and I'll say it again here. I was in the press box last year when they played Houston. Forget what that scoreboard says and forget what that box score says. Clayton Toon did not look good at all mm -hmm. against Temple. Like, mm -hmm. he just benefited from a bad Jeff Knowles defense. But even – like, he still looked bad, though. Like, if I add all of that together and I consider that Temple looks like a better team now, even though last week wasn't a great defensive game for them, this is a way better defensive – Line a def better defensive unit with a better scheme. Twenty is a lot. Like I'm, I know I'm negative Nancy on this pod, but like Houston's on upset watch this week. I really believe Temple like has a chance to make this a close game, if not steal one down there hmm. on the road. Where I mean, somebody has to make up for what the basketball team Monday, did Monday night. If they <laughs> steal one, if they win this game somehow, then the conversation becomes – Can they go happen. to a bowl game? No, the conversation becomes, I really wish they hadn't lost to Tulsa and Navy. Yep. Like, if they're four and six and you're like, crap, if they had just stolen, like, one of those, maybe you have a chance. But, like – Have they not gone for fourth down at their own 30-yard line against <laughs> – you know? Well, yeah. yeah. I, that was so long. That was a lifetime ago. Mm -hmm. We live in a different world than we did in uh... – in Rutgers times. I mean, oh. I think, I think Clayton tunes better this year than he was last year. Um, but yeah, no, I agree. Like last year was, he wasn't even like, you look at the numbers, you're like, oh, I threw for two twenty five and two touchdowns. Like, yeah. He did. He wasn't that good against temple. Um, I think it's just, this also sounds weird considering like they've had for a lot of 40 point games, including against USF, but like they had never had a game 
like so absurd, like big 12 level scoring until this week, until last week, this season, like they were playing in the thirties a lot. They beat Memphis 33, 32. They only put up 24 against Tulane. They only put up 34 against a rice team. That's going to enter the American next year and probably win two games. Like they've had some, like if Temple can keep them in the thirties, then yeah, they have a shot at this. If if they if you can sign up and say Dana Holgerson, who if you had the chance to listen to his press conference this week, gave pretty much like the career trajectory of Chris Wiesahan. He's a like, guy oh, he had rules offensive line coach. He he follows Collins down to Georgia Tech, wants to get out of that situation, comes back to Philadelphia. Like mm-hmm. a good thirty seconds of his uh, press conference was him just breaking down Temple's coaching staff. Like oh I've known Chris Woods forever, DJ Elliott's been around forever. If they can keep him in the thirties, then the, yeah they got a shot, which is absurd considering that like. I don't think any of us thought Temple was going to score 30 points in the conference game this 10 days ago. Yeah. And that's where I'm, you know, I'm kind of at is I think this offense for Houston is just going to be too much for Temple to handle. We could say, and I agree with Javon that, you know, Clayton Toon didn't look great, but his numbers this year, they're hard to argue against. He's 10th in passing yards, tied third for touchdowns in the FBS. He's had a ridiculous year. They have a legitimate number one wide receiver, Nathaniel Dale, who leads the conference in touchdowns. He's got 919 yards receiving already. They have so much, you know, firepower on offense. We've seen this Temple team, and I know it's just one game, but UCF, who, who I mean, on when it comes to stats, Houston's a better offense than UCF, and UCF dropped 70 points against this defense. Other than Leighton Jordan, he's been the only, you know, he's really been the only consistent pass rusher. Darian Varner's done it in spurts, had three and a half against Tulsa, but the last two weeks, and I know it's against Navy and they run the ball, so you kind of have to take mm-hmm. that into consideration, but he didn't get a sack last week against USF either. They don't really have guys around Leighton that, you know, are going to pin their ears back and really cause Clayton Toon to get off the spot. So I think if he's comfortable in the pocket, I think Houston can really take advantage. But on that other end, they gave up 77 points to Tanner Mordecai, who also threw nine touchdowns. And Tanner Mordecai is a good quarterback. But I don't think Tanner Mordecai is this elite quarterback that's unstoppable. And they put up 77 points against them. Maybe EJ can find some success. If they can replicate you know, a little bit of that run game from last week, maybe they can push him. But I think this game's going to have to be a shootout, which I don't think is in favor of Temple. But you never know. And there's a possibility – because I think Houston, like Javon said, has really underperformed this year. So if you're going to beat a team in these last three games, I don't think it's going to be Cincinnati, and I don't think it's going to be ECU, a team that just beat UCF a couple weeks ago. It's got to be Houston. I'm not willing to go there, but I can see where that opportunity is. But at the end of the day, I think Clayton Toon and that offense is going to be way too much for Temple to handle. Two things. You brought up Darian Vaughn. I get the feeling we'll see him at outside linebacker a lot more. Uh, After last week, no, 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 not a lot more. Here's my thing. Remember, Kyle, against Tulsa, he lined up on that edge, like, for a good amount of that game, and that's how he got those three and a half sacks. I think we'll see him line up at the edge a little bit more this game. Like, he's not, he, had uh, been, he had been lining up at the edge more in the, earlier in the season, though, right? It's not like a new thing. And then, like, they've kind of gotten away from that. Like, I think we'll see him back out there. He was the passing down edge rusher. He was, and that's how he got his three and a half sacks. I yeah. think we can see that again. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying he's lining up out there every down and dropping back. Hell no. I'm not asking Darian Varner to do that. And I think on third down, when it's time to bring the heat, we can see him over there again. We've seen it this season. Although- Before we get into predictions, how many quarterbacks has Stan Drayton called the real deal this year? <laughs> oh, a lot. So, like, where is Clayton Toon in, like, the hierarchy of AAC quarterbacks? Like, he's up there. He's probably, like, top three. He's a good quarterback. He is good. Yeah. He's not like a world beater. Part of like a long, like a long line of of Houston quarterbacks who have put up insane video game numbers who don't do much so, in the NFL. So not to say that he's gotten to the NFL yet, but like yeah, Andre, so here's the thing with, yeah. So here's the thing with that. Greg Ward, like every time that Temple plays like Houston, like Houston, except for that one year, the one year that Rockwell Armstead rushed for six touchdowns, like, well it, it just became a, sh- a shootout. Yeah. Every other time, it's like. Yeah, they lose the game, but like that Houston offense doesn't put up 60 points right. on them. Like they're always yeah. in the 30s or the 20s. Mm-hmm. So like that's kind of how I see this game going. Yeah. I think they're going to lose this game, but I don't think it's going to be a like a repeat of the SMU Houston game. John, I'm glad you pointed that out, the the real deal one. Um I got another thing to point out. Can we can can we talk about how Stan tried his best to def- to stand up for Big 12 defenses on Monday? It's like they do play defense down there. They do. They like, just are so high paced on offense. Stand the last Big Twelve coach to play defense went to the Matt Rule. 
Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, winnables, I guess. Yeah. I, I get, I, I, he, I get what he's saying. Like NFL players come out of. Yeah. They still have. Like, yeah. It happens all the time. Sure. Yeah. But like yeah. college football is so like the personality of a game dictates what that game is. Like the SMU Houston game almost became like self-serving where it's like, once you start talking about, Oh, the most points in a regulate in, in a regulation game, like they're almost like trying to make that happen. Like yeah. not that they're letting them score, but like, they just know like, Oh yeah, we'll, we'll probably get scored on here. And then we got to go score back. Like they kind of becomes self-fulfilling mm-hmm. prophecies. And the big 12 just does that eight times a year. <laughs> Yeah. What do we have? Pretty. I'm. I'm thinking 38, 28, Houston. What do you guys have? I think I'll go 35, 31, Houston. I think either a fourth down call or a penalty or a turnover loses Temple the game late. But 35, hmm. 31, Houston. I'll say 31, 20, Houston. If Clayton Toon throws three picks like he did last week, Temple wins this game. But um, I don't think that'll happen. I think. Hmm. It'll just be kind of like a whatever game, 31-20. So, so what, what, what's that third pick then? Because Tulsa threw two picks on the, in the first quarter, including the pick six, and still won the game. But what's yeah. that third pick look like? Sure. But then you see, like, last year, last game, boy, I know it's not a pick, but, like, even with, like, Jalen McMurray's, like, strip fumble, like, mm-hmm. their momentum swinging plays, even like that. Um, So, like, I'll, yeah, I, I'll just say in general, if Houston has three turnovers, I think Temple will be able to kind of fill with that. I, I, like I said, I don't think Temple's all of a sudden some bowl team. I do think they're a better team now than they were four weeks ago. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm still predicting that they lose by 11, but they're yeah. cover. They're going to cover. <laughs> all right, let's talk about. Let's dissect the um, Temple's Oof. not so good opening to their basketball season on Monday night. Uh, this was supposed to be a tune-up for Villanova on Friday night, and instead Temple responds with a 76-73 overtime loss to Wagner. I admittedly, we had a unfortunately we had a death in the family this week. I I did not see much of the game at all. Saw a couple of different pieces and parts of it here and there. I saw a lot of missed defensive assignments. I saw Nick Jordan playing fairly well, but he had a good way. Too. What's that? He had a great practice today, too. Like, hitting off-balance off middies all game long. That's also, like, the type of game and type of opponent that, like, Nick Jordan's going to play well against. Yeah. yeah. Like, when you have, like, a size advantage and you're kind of able to – like, he had four blocks because, like, you're you're more athletic than anybody else on the floor. Mm-hmm. The 12, 12 offensive rebounds, 14 second-chance points for Wagner. Again, something you just do not want to see against any opponent – Javon pointed out, hey, maybe maybe Wagner is better than we think. But either way, bad loss. What happened? Um, I think th- this is going to sound dumb because I know it's not true. I think Temple's coaching staff and Temple fully entered that game thinking we're going to have Jameel Reynolds take 18 shots and we're just going to bully him down low because we have such a size advantage. And you saw that when Jameel Reynolds was on the floor. Then you saw Jameel Reynolds bear hug somebody on defense on back-to-back possessions and get two, sh- two early fouls that got him out of the game. I don't think Temple adjusted after that whatsoever. I think once their initial game plan went out the window, it just became like, oh, crap. We're going to have to have, you know, Damian Dunn get to the line, which to his credit, like he tied Lynn Greer for the most free throws ever in a game, despite what ESPN plus his broadcast said. Um, he got a big five record for that too, and City Six. I don't buy into City Six. It's not a thing. <laughs> like, it's not a thing. Um, but yeah, no, it's a guy. I didn't know the big five thing. That's a good point. Or a good stat. Uh, I think they they relied too heavily on that at that point, which to its credit worked to an extent. I think they wanted Caleb Battle to play um, hero ball a bit in the second half, which he was a lot better in the second half than he was in the first half. But this Temple offense is not going to do much if Zach Hicks is going one for eight and they're shooting 25% from three. I think it's a combination of, did they look past his opponent? Sure, they won't, they'll never say it. But yeah, they absolutely did. Like Wagner won 21 games last year, but they also lost 80% of their roster when... Bashir Mason went to St. Peter's. I I think they just never adjusted. I really I I think when they kind of had fools gold a bit when they went up 15, and they just thought, look, we're so much better than this team, we can just go through the motions. And Wagner, to its credit, first game under a new coach, just said, like, screw it, we're still in this. I also wow. I understand people are upset and that they think the built like the season's over. It is game one. Um, just flush it and move on. But yeah, terrible start to the season. I, I will add on that uh in the post game, and, and, and this isn't anything like they've said to me. This is 
me putting on my my former high school and middle school player hat. Caleb Battle seemed a little bit happy that that game happened. Like and and Kyle, I think you know where I'm about to go with this. The number one guy is happy when his team loses because they didn't give him the ball down the stretch. Is he and the number I one think, guy? Yeah, come on. KB is still the number one guy. Let's mm-hmm. be honest. He's the best scorer on that team. I mean, I just saw Damian Dunn get 29 points in a, a methodical old man style way. I, I, I hear you, Kyle. And I'm a fan of Dame Dunn's game. And I think he's the second option. Um, But I still think this is KB's team. The staff needs to adjust as such. And a guy with that talent, like, can now say, all right, fellas, y'all know what happened against Wagner. Like, this is basketball locker room talk. He can now say, y'all know what happened against Wagner. Like, give me the ball in these last three minutes of games and let me carry y'all to a closeout win. Like, that's the vibe I got from him. Um, And he said Monday in the postgame, he said in practice today, like, that first half was me getting my feet wet, having played ball in almost a year. That second half, let me know I'm back. And uh, I asked him, like, we saw what you did against USC. That's what Villanova is this year. And um, I fully expect KB to have himself a game Friday night. I, I mean, good. Like, I hope he, I hope he does because like they are a better offense when he's shooting forty five percent from three, right? Like, of course they are. But like, I really, I if I find it hard to be like sympathetic about a guy like, oh yeah, you got you're coming off the bench, but like you played thirty eight minutes and took sixteen shots. Oh yeah. Like your role is still huge on this team. Mm-hmm. So like. I do. I think fast forward ten games from now, Caleb Bell is coming off the bench. No, I think eventually he works his way back into the lineup. But like for now, like if if they're if he thought that like okay, we needed to lose one for me, it's like for the the right order of things to play themselves out and for me to get back into the situation I was. I don't buy into that because like you played thirty eight minutes. I don't think it was a him coming off the bench thing. I think it was a give me the ball down and the stretch more to the game thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he had what thirteen points in the second half. Like he had. Hit opportunities, but yeah, no, I mean, I think uh, we've talked about this ad nauseum where the biggest issue with this team we thought was going to be like, can they work Caleb battle back into this without disrupting the flow that they got in elsewhere and through one game? No, but if you beat Villanova, everything's forgiven. Yeah. I so, mean, Wagner's projected to win the Northeast conference. With, but so like, that's it, like the definition of a projection because only like one guy has played for Wagner before <laughs> Monday, right. like, like, like I, they're putting a lot of stuff into, like, did did they recruit well and are they going to mesh together? And to the credit, like, they just – this sounds cliche and, like, WIP-ish, but, like, the other team wanted it more. Like, Wagner, like, legitimately was winning, like, hustle rebounds despite the fact they started five guards. Like, Temple's, so, Temple – I still think Temple's a good team. They're not a good enough team to just go through the motions and think they're going to beat teams. And so, you saw a reoccurring um, issue, too. I, I'm still trying to remember which conference game it was. That they lost off a simple trail man three last season that I did a story on and incorrectly said it was Zach Hicks's fault. And Jeff Hicks DM'd me and told me to look at the film. And he was right. It was a miscommunication that went beyond Zach. But Monday, how did that game get tied? Once again, trail man three send it into overtime. What, what concerns me even more than that is right after that, the play out of the timeout at the end of regulation. I was like, what the hell are you guys doing? They were playing the a football held play. that ball for way too long. Yeah, he like, killed the clock. It was a strange end of regulation and even like strange end of overtime. Like it just seems like they almost acted like they were the team that had never really played together before and they didn't know situational awareness for that. It felt so, like they didn't want to step on each other's toes a little bit. Much. Yeah, and that'll, that'll work itself out, right? There needs to be somebody on the team that's like like the guy, like the alpha guy. And like, does that become Caleb Battle? Does that become Damian Dunn? But there needs to be somebody that has that to quote, to take him from Twitter, has a little bit of like that mama mentality of like, I don't give a shit if I'm stepping on your toes. Like the ball's in my hands here. Yeah. So I, I think I think, I think if Shane is only plays Monday, they win that game. Because so I think he is that scorer off the bench that doesn't allow Wagner to get back in it when the starters take a little bit of a breather. Yeah. Um but I mean, yeah, I, also, like I, I think that's why you saw like part of the reason you saw Caleb Bell come off the bench is I think Aaron McKee is envisioning like I should be able to roll out like two units at times, including one where Ballard just becomes like I don't need them. Like if they can't play that well together, great. I'll play them 15 minutes a game when they're not on the floor together. But unfortunately, like they just didn't play out that way. You were down there today. You can't, win with, you can't win with Hasir Miller and Jalil White only attempting four mm-hmm. shots apiece. I mean, like four shots combined. Now, do we know if right. do we know if Dazoni's playing Friday? Um, Larry told me uh Monday was a like he 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 wanted to play Monday, but he hadn't practiced, so the staff wasn't gonna put him out there. 
I fully expect them to play Friday. So, yeah, here's the question. How do they respond Friday? So Villanova beat LaSalle and Fran Dunphy, 81-68 in its opener. So Caleb Daniels had 24 points. Eric Dixon had 20. They shot 13 of 20 from three in that game. And uh, six of seven of those threes came from, from Caleb Daniels. I would assume that Jaleel White's going to probably be guarding him Friday night. So Jaleel's got to stay out of, you know, stay on the floor, stay out of foul trouble. Um, how do you think they respond Friday night? I think, um, like I said, I expect KB to have a big game. Um, I think we know him and – I think him and Dame are, like, emotional leaders of the team. I, I fully – I see them in the pregame, like, telling their telling their guys, yo, we ain't losing this game. Like, what happened Monday ain't going on. Like, turn it around because I'm not losing like that ever again, which was basically KB's message Monday and today. Um. I think they're fired up. I think the leaders of that team get those guys going. I think the Jamil Reynolds coming out party is probably Friday. Because as much as I, I love the way Eric Dixon plays, and I respect his game, but he is small. I think if there's any big man in the big five who has something for Eric Dixon, it's going to be 280 pounds, six foot eleven Jamil Reynolds. I think we're in for a treat Friday. This could very much be a win for Temple. It could very much be a loss for Temple. I think it's one of those games where if you're not on assignment and you don't have anything to write, you just kick back, put your feet up, and enjoy a good game of basketball. You're describing the Kyle Gauss life. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to li- almost like copy and paste everything Javon just said. I, I love Eric Dixon. Abington kid right in my backyard. I think he's a little short for or a little, little small, which is absurd when you consider he's 250 pounds, a little small for Jamil Reynolds. If Jamil Reynolds can stay out of foul trouble in this game, like he should be able to score on Eric Dixon. Um, if, if you can tell me that Caleb Battle is going to have like one of those games, then like, yeah, I think they have a shot at this. I'm going to just say this is a must win as far as their at large bid is concerned. Yeah. Like, like you can't just get through it with like beating the teams that like you're supposed to beat at this point. Like, if you had beaten Wagner, then, like, okay, maybe if you beat Vandy and you steal one in the Empire Classic and you beat VCU and you do your thing, like, maybe you have a shot at that. You are probably going to have a bad loss now at this point. A home loss to an NEC team, even if that team wins the NEC, probably is not going to look good on paper going forward. So you need to win a game that you're not supposed to win. I think that they're established enough that they also know this. I, I think they might win this game. Like, I I, I kind of get the feeling that, like, if there's any year they're going to beat Nova, it's this year. And I think they need to beat Nova to have a chance at large. Otherwise, you're hoping that Houston loses in the conference tournament somehow and you can somehow win the conference is your only chance. And then, yeah, I mean – Oh, God, John. Neptune is is it was, it's his first season, his second game. Fran Dunphy coached himself into that game on Monday night. Like, a LaSalle team that is not good only lost by 13, you know, like, so your temple, you're looking at that. Um, and I think the only thing that can go wrong with my Jamil Reynolds thing is one foul trouble or number two, depends on how much Nana and Joku plays for Nova. Like does Neptune roll him out and say, all right, you're our big body. Uh-huh. Go out there with Jamil. And does he have something for Jamil Reynolds? Uh, I, I think I'm that would be like the one potential matchup to watch. The, did Jamil Reynolds show enough? in game one against Wagner that like a team like Nova who only has to care about Temple for, you know, three days of the year, like game plan around him would be kind of my, like it might be a benefit in disguise that he only played, you know, 15 minutes or whatever. And he might, he might be number four on their game plan. on how to shut down Temple and that might come back to bite them. And no, you know, no, Justin Moore, obviously no, yeah, Cam so Whit- injured. <laughs> no, no Cam Whitmore, but still good. I mean, still, again, you can say what you want about LaSalle hanging around in that game. They still played a similar style. They defend, they move well without the ball. Kyle Neptune, even though he was, he was away for a year, knows this program. Well, um, yeah, certainly should be an interesting game. We will, we'll close, close things out here. Cause these are quick, all, they play four and five in offense a lot with Chris, Ar- with Chris Archidiacono on the floor. So yeah, they do. Yep. That could also be a mismatch. Yes. Uh, we got several mailbag questions, all basketball related here to close things out. So we got plenty more basketball talk for you here. These are all from our basketball subscriber message board. First one comes from the screen name JHG722. 
lack of killer instinct read dog has been an issue at Temple for a while. What would you attribute this to? I, I, I don't know. I, I think they've had, if he's talking about lack of killer instinct down the stretch, uh, I think it's been, I'd say everything. It's, it's a, a lack of having a, I don't know. I mean, Dame, Dame had three game winners last year, but right. like obviously lack of killer instinct hurt on Monday. I think Monday, I think it was everything you guys said. It was, they took him for granted. I think lack of killer instinct in the past has been recruiting lapses, lack of talent, but I think it's been a little bit of everything, but I don't know. That probably sounds like a wishy-washy answer, but what do you guys think? Yeah. I don't know. Lack of dog comes off to me. He's like, are you calling him saw? Cause I don't, I don't know that they've been necessarily soft. I don't right. know. But... Yeah. I don't, I, I, I don't I think it's soft at all. Box. Yeah. I, I, I look back at some of the history. I, I, I get that he's probably trying to make this out to be like, Oh, it's been like 15 years of them having like soft guys up there. And I don't necessarily believe that. Like, I think they've had guys in the past that, have been quote unquote dogs, as he would say. But I think on this team, like it, it's a little bit of like, you know, recency bias, like because they didn't have it against Wagner. So I think if I had to chalk up, like, why didn't they have that against Wagner? It's kind of like what Javon said earlier, where I think they were a little bit afraid to step on each other's feet. And they've just gone through like three or four months of like everything kind of coming up Temple and they're smelling themselves a little bit. And look, this is the year that we put Temple back on the map. We're the best team in the Big Five, blah, blah. blah. And then they had a rude awakening. So yeah, and every talented team has that problem like good teams part of their growing pain is one nobody wants to step on each other's toes and somebody has to make it uncomfortable for them to turn the corner and also every good team will tell you the one game that they lost where their coaching staff went into practice the next day and was like yeah now y'all gotta listen to us and that was that game from McKee, Finnerty, Clark and those guys like they've got that out the way early first game of the season right. like, that's actually a good thing you know how many teams in basketball history wish they got two of those boxes checked in the first game of the season like I, i'm i'm yeah i can't i'm not answering this one yeah you you lose you'd rather lose this game game one than you know lose game 18 like this for sure because like uh, also just i mean tournament resumes tend to like discredit losses early on kind of times get written out of the way but also like i saw damian dunn almost physically assault a wagner player because he was so pissed off so like i don't necessarily buy the notion yeah. that like yeah that they're like but dude told Dame to meet him in the tunnel and i'm like dude i don't think you want to do that no do like that. No. <laughs> honestly like good like again i don't want to undermine what wagner did like good for them like they did exactly what you have to do when you come in on the road as a 15 point dog yeah, and, and, and like, I'll be looking for them in the Northeast Conference tournament. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm good job. Y'all, I, y'all got my attention. Yes, mm-hmm. but like Kyle said, man, relax. It took us it took us a matter of days for our next mailbag question here to materialize when someone's looking at Aaron McKee's job. Uh, this comes from Esther Boyer is the screen name. Hi all. Is this a make or break year for McKee? And can each of you give your pick of a hypothetical and ideal name to replace Aaron next season? First things first, it, it's going to be stupid for us to start naming coaching replacements for Aaron McKee. Again, I don't expect anybody to be happy at all with that, with that game Monday night. Uh, but for us to just sit around and speculate about replacements for Aaron McKee when he's still the coach here is kind of premature. Very, very yeah. clickbaity. Yeah. Yeah. Now, is this a make or break year? No. I mean, if they, if they go out and they're a 500 team this year, yeah, it's a bad season for Aaron McKee. I'm going to borrow what, what Ari Rosenfeld said when he was on our podcast a few months ago. Yeah. I mean, they, they're, yes, they have tournament aspirations. They should get to the NCAA tournament this year. Just got a little tougher after Monday night. Uh, It depends on like what, what you think make or break is if they go again, if they're a 500 team sub 500 year, then yeah, I think that's, that's troublesome. If they narrowly miss the NCAA tournament, but you see a lot of growth, I don't know. But make or break year, yes, they need to show significant, significant progress this year. No question. Is it make or break where like the administration's out to fire him? I don't think that's the case, but I can't say that I know Arthur Johnson's thinking on this. I'll say this. Obviously, I don't know Arthur Johnson's thinking either way. But logistically and just like business-wise and administratively, one thing this has to come to a conclusion one way or the other after this year. Like he has a five year contract. This is year four. You either have to get rid of Aaron McKee or you have to extend him after this year. You cannot have him going out there recruiting as a lame duck coach because it just won't happen. Nobody's going to commit to a program where the coach doesn't have a contract after. There's an excellent that. point. 
So one way or the other, this is going to come to a come to a, a resolution in the next six months. Five I months, do think. Um, months. I think at the very least, Aaron needs to be a top four seed in the NIT, which means first four out. Um, but I do think the tournament is what gets him an extension, and is what really gets. I think, I think NIT gets some extension, to be honest. Yeah, and and really gets like athletes to be like, okay, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll go commit to Temple mm-hmm. um, instead of dipping my feet in and out. Um, but also on the recruiting tip, like, yeah, I'm with Kyle on that, and I'd also add on the, the schools got to catch up on some NIL stuff too if they want to sure. start Johnson. So like nobody's committing to a lame duck coach, and and I can't remember who I was telling this to, but like I look at just the rest of the schools in the state compared to where Temple is with it right now. I can just speak from my own experiences and the guys I knew in the neighborhoods I grew up in. Every broke black kid in the Northeast is going to choose the school that is saying I'm all for getting my players money, than the school that's afraid to even talk about it. So they've got to catch up on that drastically. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's inexcusable where they are. Um, but no, if they miss the tournament and NIT isn't even a thing for them, like if they're not first four out at the very least, maybe you do start poking around at Matt Langley, you know? Um after that, mm. I, I I you guys would have more I don't know I don't know how much Matt Langle would be all about the NIL life either, but it's a fair point. It's a, a mm-hmm. good name to throw out there. Yeah, like you guys would have more insight into who else would be potential candidates than I would, right? But um, I know that's like the the obvious one, so I'll throw it out there just for the sake of answering the question. Next question, D Blaze seventy five thoughts on Core John Kutch and and Nick Jordan after the Wagner debacle. I expect the core to be much better defensively rebounding the ball, whereas Jordan was all over the place blocking shots and the boards while pretty good on defense. If he could only hit threes and maintain his composure, where does Jordan fit in with this team? So we got two questions here. Thoughts on Core. And Nick Jordan, and then where does Nick Jordan fit in with this team? I don't think there was really much for core Monday. Like, it's not like Wagner's a team that's going to try to pound you inside. Right. And that's what core is there for. You're not going to notice core's impact unless it's against a team that focuses on points in the paint. That's when you'll see his impact. Because he's not an offensive player whatsoever, right? And defensively, it's not like you're asking him to, you know, go guard one through five. Like, you might want him to switch and then get back on a, on the a rotation. But you're not going to know the score until it's a team that wants to pound you inside. So too early to judge him, too early to judge Jamil. So calm down on that. And um, with Nick, like I said, he's got the non-conference schedule to submit his minutes. Like he's not, you know, Jake Forrester, but he's on the Jake Forrester, you know, test right now, I Jake guess. Jake Forrester who played well in his St. Louis debut. Yeah, so like Nick – off to a great start to the season. And like I said, from what I've seen from him, uh, what I saw from him in practice today was much be- much better than what I saw from him in practice last week. So um, it's just going to be if Nick Jordan can string together enough good days on game day. Yeah, I still don't want him to – he attempted two threes. I don't want him to attempt those two threes. Um, I, I, I don't know if this is a real phrase, but I'm going to say this. He's like – he's the combo big in their – rotation right now where like you can bring him off the bench and he can play as a big a big three or he can play four and they even played him at like the five a little bit against Wagner like Nick Jordan's gonna be like the 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 itch that you can't really get rid of where like we keep kind of writing him off and maybe he just maybe does end up still playing 25 minutes a game for this team but sample size of one uh, I've definitely been guilty of uh overreacting to sample sizes of one in my life but try not to in this one <laughs> Uh, we should have fun with this one. The next question comes from TU Owls fan 2004. Not trying to get very political, but if you had to vote for one current Al scooper to send uh, to send to a major office, yeah, yeah, I know some of you might not qualify age wise. Who would it be? So let's assume that you don't have to be. Well, only you qualify for president. Office. It's 25 for uh, House of Representatives too, right? So only yeah, Javon's limited. Well, well let's. Send- who? I'm sending you. I'm not. I'm just not calm enough to go for office. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that's why. Me and the guys on the Senate floor, the House floor, would just get into so many arguments and there'd be so many people. You can't see this. You can't see that. And just my approval rating would be down the drain because people don't like the way I go about business. I'm not meant for politics. And Kyle keeps it very real. 
people who don't like people who keep it. I'm not electable. I'm the definition of not electable. Yeah. yeah. Like Why do you say that, Kyle? I, I, I mean, I'm sure there's skeletons somewhere. The last thing I need is people talking about Bouvier Street parties from 2008 when I'm out there, like, st- uh, stomping. Like, yeah, I'm sure there's sound clips out there that aren't <laughs> aren't great. <laughs> not electable. Uh, I, 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 the type I kind of fall back to a lot of things with politics. The type of people that like seek out political offices are not the type of people that should be in political offices. So yeah, no, like Dante doesn't care enough. Sam wouldn't take it seriously enough. Carolina I'll also Sam say this. I, I, out enough. Well, yeah, Ca- I mean Boston Sam. Like last thing we need is them uh, pulling his cell phone records from January sixth. <laughs> <laughs> that is. I, a- I, guess, I guess I'll. Say, I'm gonna say Caden. I'm gonna say, look, we need good people we need to put the goodness back in american politics and canaan might be the nicest of all of us another guy so from gonna, delaware another guy I'm from delaware Kaden, yeah. i'm gonna put caden out there keep the I first state connection going, going. What's that? yeah me, me and javon would be like it'd be like the old like 1800s british parliament where people are like slinging shit at each other like in the middle of these conversations <laughs> like we would not be good in in congress uh John, I love you like a brother. I don't think you're great for politics. I don't think I, I, I'm imagining you trying to like drive through a policy. I you're just gonna like play both sides of it. You're gonna really apologize for saying something mean to somebody. I just want Caden in there. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, gotta go, Caden. He's right because yeah. John is the king of. Like, look, I like, hate. I, I hate I to say this. To look, I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I understand Lindsey Graham, very nice guy, but I, like, <laughs> I would not say that about Lindsey Graham. But anyway, until, you, until you're face to face with him, be like Lindsey, Lindsey. I know it was hard being named Lindsey growing up. I I, I feel that, but <laughs> Kyle, let's run for office in 2032. Let's let's give people a taste of what we have in store. Assuming oh. you know we're still in this country in 2032. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last question here from shy town al i was surprised i was pretty surprised and disappointed by the obvious defensive deficiencies against much smaller and less athletic wagner team allowing 12 offensive rebounds open shots galore not shifting or shifting late fouling three-point shooters etc cetera, etc cetera. also from a coaching perspective i don't recall them changing defenses at all to expose the weaknesses of the opponent do you think this was an aberration and something that can and will be turned around, or should we be talk? Uh, should we should we be taking over all the? T- uh, should we taking over taking, taking the over, oh, excuse me all- sorry taking the over on all Temple games going forward this season? Hmm. Was it an aberration for like for the loss or like defensively? Is it an aberration? I think it's yeah. defensively that they're answering. Yeah. I don't I know. Would, I mean, how much how much of their defensive prowess last year was because of Jeremiah Williams at times. Um, that's the, that, I think that's what they missed on, yeah. on Monday. They missed the Jay Will. Um, like you, you made, a, com- us- you oh, made a comment earlier about like Jaleel White like needs to be like more aggressive on offense. Like, yeah, sure. But like he also needs to be like that dude on defense, right? Like we oh, talked and about stay that. on the floor on defense. Yeah. So I think I mean I think that hurt them a lot. Like he needs to play a lot more in 18 minutes for this team. Yeah. Um to be a good defensive team. I think he will because he's got a he. I, but I think I think that'll be fine. Like I'm sure a lot of it's first night jitters and like they thought like oh we're just gonna put on a show and then we do this. Like I have an entire season of track record of Jaleel White staying on the floor. Yeah. So like I'm hopeful that that probably plays out. But like I think that combined with Jeremiah Williams being gone is still kind of like the first thing. Jaleel White needs to play at that level as their number one mm-hmm. defender. Yeah, you know, like Jaleel's been getting a lot of burn. Um. Like and he like it seems like he's always playing with the Dame when they do scrimmage and practice this year, and like Jalil kind of brings the ball up more than Dame, but he guards the primary ball handler more too, and I think they want him as like re- replicating what Jay Will did last year, try to feel out how aggressive he can be against these ball handlers. Um, I think that's what Monday was, and I saw it again in practice today. Like he's. He's going to poke around a lot for these first couple games to get a feel for it and see what he can get away with. Um, and I don't know if it's aberration. Like, yes, you do want your defense to come out hot and your offense to pick up later on. But, like, I don't know. I can't call it an aberration because I don't think they had as many breakdowns as people say. Like, I'm definitely – and I should have did it last night since there was no good basketball on. But <laughs> I'm going to go watch the full game either tonight or tomorrow morning 
to really like do my deep dive into it. But I don't think there is as many breakdowns as people think. Like there are some slip ups here and there that were mistimed, but I don't think there were just a bunch of breakdowns. They'll tighten up. I'm more than sure that they'll tighten up. Yeah, like look, I mean, a lot of if you a lot of games, if you're gonna hold your opponents at 28% from three and like 40% from the field, like you're gonna be in a lot of games. So like I agree, it's not like they just got like shot out of the gym. Yeah. There were all these breakdowns and things collapsed. I think more of it was you're turning the ball over on offense and you were lackluster on the offensive boards. But one thing that you just mentioned about Jaleel bringing the ball up in practice with uh, with Dame, that's kind of one of the reasons I still think 10 games in, Caleb Battle is going to find his way back on the starting lineup. Because if, if High Seer Miller is out there and he's just only sh- attempting two shots a game, he might lose that starting spot eventually. And they might just go, look. The best. I don't think you're at your best with High Seer starting if you're attempting. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I love High Seer. That's just like his mentality. And I think he has a role in this team. And like, it's again, it's a sample size of one. And he played really well down the stretch. But like, if he continue, if he does what he did against Wagner for like eight games, then they might just say, like, screw it. Get Caleb back in the starting lineup. We'll kind of do this by committee as a combination of Jaleel, Caleb, Dame, and we'll just figure out running the offense through them. Yeah, I think their best lineup is Dame and KB in the backcourt, point forward Jaleel, stretch forward Zach, and Jamil down low. Like, I think High Seer, back to his Newman Garetti days in the era of the PCL that he played in, and combined from what we saw from last year, High Seer Miller's a good point guard. Let's not get yeah. confused. But sure. He's not an attacking guy. Like he is. If Hashir Miller is your backup point guard, you are a pretty good team. And I think yeah. you need to embrace that. When you've got hey, a look. combo guard like Dame and a point forward like Jalil, let them run the starting lineup and let Hashir just feed Shane Dizoni all day in the second unit. And hey, look, and we've seen. I mean, John and I have seen couple point guards go from not wanting to shoot the ball to they come back the next year and they look like guys that like they're seventeen point a game guys. So like well, it I'm... happens. Like Will Cummings is the definition of that. He was yeah. just along for the ride his sophomore year. And then when he needed to, he looked like a completely different guard his junior year. So, like, does is Heiser Miller still played 39 minutes in game one? Is his career over? No, it's nowhere close to over. It's just starting. But he needs to be more aggressive on the offensive side. Well, we'll have a lot more to talk about next week. More hoops, more football. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Keep an eye on the political careers of Kyle Gauss and Javon Edmonds and Caden Steele. Unelectable. Yeah. It'd be like I would announce on a Tuesday, and by Wednesday, there'd be like G chat messages from 2011. Like, would you want this guy representing you? <laughs> <laughs> like, when's the Thursday night? I'm resigning. Kyle, I'm Honestly. telling you, the way my friends play around too much, they would purposefully leak it to somebody. <laughs> they called me to get on the Xbox the next day and laugh that what they sabotaged my career. But you'd be pissed, and then like a week later, you'd be like, I really appreciate you. You guys oh yeah right out of there. Like, yeah. <laughs> all right well thanks for sticking with us for another episode we'll talk to you guys next week